Welcome to another Café, Re Café Rollist. Uh, as always, uh, things happen randomly via Twitter. And today I have a fellow fan of, for thing people can see behind me, Hey Dougie, uh, lovely yes. CB, CBB shows uh, for children. Hello, hey, Matt. Uh, what's your connection to Hey Dougie? <laughs> And who are you? Hey, how's it going? Um, yeah, my son, who is four, um, loves Hey Doggy. He's kind of grown out of it now, but my daughter is one and a half and she is obsessed with Hey Doggy. Like she she will get up after her having a breakfast and she runs over and gets the, the controller for the TV to turn on Netflix. Or if she hears Netflix come on, she'll run in from another room and sit herself on the couch to watch uh, watch Hey Doggy. So uh yeah, my, my I son... mean, she could be watching worse things. I, I love Hey Dougie. It's so nice. It's really well done, and there are, there are inside jokes for adults in there, which are quite smart. There, there, there's a future episode uh, in which you see uh, Rolly's father uh, riding the Akira red motorcycle. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of inside jokes. There, there, some Doctor Who jokes in there. Also, even there's even an Apocalypse Now episode. Oddly enough. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So there's like a Simpsons joke in there. At one point, they cut Dougie's hair and it looks like Homer. Uh, yeah, yeah. We watch it on Netflix, so we only have one season, but we have it recorded on uh, on Sky as well. So we have a couple of couple more episodes. It's like a castaway episode where they get lost, stranded on a desert island and stuff. You don't yeah, have no, access. It's a lovely show. You don't have access to BBC. What is called view view thing? Because there's everything there. Oh, yeah, yeah. But just, you know, if we're... Actually, I must install that on my TV. That's a good idea. Sometimes you get weird stuff where, it, even though, you know, in in Ireland, we have access to BBC and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of the time, you'll be locked out of the, the streaming stuff. So if you have to go to the BBC website, you can't use the BBC player and things like that, which is which is really, uh, really odd. Um, yeah, it was like that when I was in Belgium. Uh, sometimes... Uh... Mm. Yeah, geographic things are, are a bit weird, and uh, yeah, it, it's funny Netflix because they have they have a lot of good shows, but they even in for adult Japan animation, they got like one season one, like they got season one of Attack on Titan. It's like yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, I need to watch the second. There's like three seasons out now. I think the uh, fourth yeah. is coming out. Or it's the last one. So if you want yeah. to follow things, you you need to to wa watch everything. You get and, like Crunchyroll or something like that, or whatever whatever it is. Yeah, I had con Crunchyroll for for quite a while, and uh, yeah, so, since I don't have much time to watch TV without my son in the room, who's <laughs> yeah, exactly, just turned yeah. two and a half. Uh, he's been through Dougie phases several times and then got out of it and watched uh, Trilly Boos and, and all the stuff. This is great content, by the way, today. Uh, people who are into yeah, tabletop really role playing content, game, yeah. they, they're yeah. very happy. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, uh, are there plans that, or maybe that's the opportunity to make the big announcement? Hey, Dougie is coming as a role playing game to Cubicle 7. <laughs> Am I right? I wish. I was actually joking about that in the office the other day. <laughs> like we need a, we have a, we have the three Warhammer lines. So we have, you know, Warhammer Fantasy, Warhammer Age of Sigmar, and Warhammer 40K. And it was like, you know, they're all amazing lines that we love working on, but it is uh, generally it's full of, you know, war and fighting <laughs> and stuff. It's like, we need a nice chilled out, calm role playing game where everyone just plays the squirrels from Hey Dougie. <laughs> Are you mad? You should go for it. I mean, who knows? The, it's developing the market of. Yeah, we have Doctor Who as well, so you know yeah, Doctor Who yeah. is, is. But you know, you're, you've nice got your, your. You need to go against the against or alongside uh, your tales of Equestria, your your labyrinth, yeah. your no thank yeah. you evil. It's a it's a market. You know, it's not so much young players, I think, as it is parents role players who are looking for stuff yeah. to get their children on board. Yeah, Shira. That's what I want. I want Shira. Oh yeah, everybody wants Great. that. There's a yeah. Master of or, the uh, Universe one. My coming. Hero Academia or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, th there's a lot of amazing shows on Netflix at the moment. I was very pleasantly surprised to hear that Dragon Prince was coming in the form of a oh yeah tabletop yeah. role playing game. Uh, but yeah, your your Kipo, your Ilda, uh, all of that would make uh, amazing uh, role playing games. I think. But Warhammer. Yeah, I think we have enough to work on at the moment. It'll <laughs> <laughs> do for now. Uh, I was about to insert a Lord of the Rings jokes in there, but I won't. Uh, so, 
<laughs> but uh, Warhammer 40k, there was a a children comic books which came out uh, around the type of at uh, the time of UK Games Expo two years ago. Yeah, there's um there's two kids books lines for Age of Sigmar and for Warhammer 40k. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe the audio books for 40k are read by David Tennant. Okay. <laughs> and the audio books for Age of Sigmar are read by Billy Piper, I think. Oh, wow. So you have that kind of like Doctor Who. You got <laughs> your connection uh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they're really cool. They're really, really nice stuff. Well, um, it's interesting. It, I know uh, I interviewed uh, Dominic. Uh, he actually was one of the, the first people I interviewed at, at the convention. It was in Dragon Meat. Uh, we just celebrated our fifth anniversary, so it was four years and a half. Uh, and back then, I don't think you didn't have any Warhammer, but it feels a bit like to me now, as a, someone who moved to the UK and got to know a bit the, the scene, it feels a bit like you carrying the torch of British tabletop role-playing game, I find, because White Dwarf used to be the big thing, Games Workshop was the, was the big tabletop publisher, Games Workshop is not that anymore, but uh, don't worry, Cubicle 7 is taking care of all of that for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're very lucky that um, Games Workshop approached us to take on the fourth edition of the Warhammer Fantasy um, RPG and, and asked us to develop um, an Age of Sigmar RPG, which became Soulbound. Um, and then last year as well, we took over the license from Ulysses for um, 40k for Wrath and Glory. They had done some, some great work on that. Um, so we took that over and we have that now as well. So we have uh, we have fantasy and we have Age of Sigmar and we have 40k. So yeah, we have a uh, we've all the Warhammer um Warhammer RPGs in house now, which is really good. You know, it's it's incredible to be working on these these IPs that are so treasured and loved by so many people. Um for me, you know, I think you've you talked to a lot of people and Warhammer Fantasy was one of their first role playing games, particularly in, in England and Britain and, and, and Ireland. Um and then, you know, we brought out Soulbound, which is going to be, you know, potentially a lot of people's first role playing game, first uh, first step into the Age of Sigmar universe. So, you know, to be able to create the first edition of something is uh, is very cool for us. Um, and obviously continue working on Warhammer Fantasy and, and Warhammer 40K. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, and then we have Doctor Who as well. So obviously another, another great British uh, export. Um, and then we'll have our our own IP is still ticking away in the background. Um, that hopefully we'll have some some news on in the in the next little while. Oh, great! Well, it's um, I, I'm I'm really a, a philistine of Warhammer. Uh, one might say a heretic, I believe. But what's actually Age of Sigma? Because for me, it's clear you got Warhammer Fantasy. It's in the past, and you got 40k. It's in the far future. Uh, but where where's those Soulbound and Age of Sigma uh, sit? Uh, what what is it about? <clears throat> yeah, so Age of Sigmar w is kind of mythic fantasy, I would say. It's um where you have you know Warhammer fantasy is uh, grim and perilous and and dirty and grimy, kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps from the gutter, uh, kind of thing. And 40k is obviously you know in the in the far future of the the 41st millennium. Um, you have all your technology and and um the the oppressive nature of the Imperium and everything like that. With uh, with Age of Sigmar, it's yeah, it's it's kind of mythic fantasy. Um this this great kind of creation myth, the idea being that at the end of the the end times with the old world, um the the world exploded or it, it was destroyed by chaos. And then uh Sigmar the was left clinging to the remnants of the world that was um which is called the malice which is it's a shard um he was rescued from the ether by the great drake or the great dragon dracotheon and discovered these eight mortal realms which are akin to the eight lores of magic or the eight winds of magic from warhammer fantasy so you have the realm of fire and the realm of beasts and the realm of life and the realm of death and you have um so you have these eight eight near infinite realms effectively infinite realms and then you have the realm of chaos as well, of course. Um, so Age of Sigmar kind of, it, yeah, it's, I would say like mythic fantasy, post-apocalyptic horror with some steampunk in there as well. So you've uh, like, you know, you have the, the Caradron Overlords, which are probably one of the coolest factions people might be familiar with, which are kind of steampunk 
uh, Dwarden um, have these airships and they have these like personal balloons that have this ether gold in them that floats them up into the air and they have you know basically gatling guns and all these kind of things um and, and chain swords and stuff um so you yeah it's 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 there's a lot going on in it but you have th there's more hope i would say a lot of the time um where you know the world is just coming out of the age of chaos which was um centuries of demons and cannibals overrunning the entire mortal realms and Sigmar uh, returned with his Stormcast Eternals, who are these you know, uh, demigod-like beings clad in gold armor and kind of sort of made of lightning um, that came back and pushed back the, the forces of chaos. So now you have this these points of light in the setting, which are these cities of Sigmar, which people kind of make in a life for themselves and, and eke out this existence. But outside the walls of the city, it's just still full of chaos and undeath and Oroks and Gits and everything um so you have people who would basically live and die behind the walls of these cities not not dissimilar to attack on titan where it's it's basically you know suicide to go beyond the walls it's too dangerous um in soulbound you play one of the heroes tasked with defending these cities and who are you know potentially brave and or stupid enough to go outside the walls of the city if need be it reminds me a bit of a a, a french game which uh, oddly enough had a, an english title although i don't think there's ever was a English edition, uh, it was Dark Earth, in which the, the world was plunged into darkness covered by this cloud, mm. but sometimes piercing through the clouds, uh, maybe sometimes sitting right on top uh, of a volcano or something like that. You have columns on la of light and and cities would congregate under that column of light and you, you'd go around. So you had to deal with stuff happening in the city, which, well, due to the the dangers around, uh, again, like Attack on Titan, I imagine, you know, Soulbound, you had political scheming going on and uh, people sure. being subdued because they, they were scared to be thrown outside of the wall. And then you had explorers who went into the darkness to, to explore what was going on. I should do an episode about that game uh, someday. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the French RPGs, there's so many that have come out in the past that I don't think a lot of us ever got to see, you know, that's why I love going to, um, even, you know, when I go to Essen or whatever, have a dig through the, the classic RPG library. Not that I'd ever be able to read them. <laughs> and my, my French isn't, isn't what it used to be. Um, well, but yeah, you, yeah. It's, it's that kind of thing. If people want to try, try more stuff, uh, I don't know, uh, non French speaking friendly, those events will be, but, uh, there's, there are three conventions uh, which will take place online, which two of them usually are physical conventions. So Octagon, uh, I put link in the description. So I check, I recommend people to go check Octagon and Les Utopiales. Les Utopiales being more about fantasy in general. So it's not just about role-playing game or games, but uh, writers, novelists, and, and so on. And uh, tonight there should be an announcement regarding CyberConv, which was a convention which was launched at the beginning of the lockdown uh, as a result uh, of other stuff being cancelled. And the first edition so far has been the best online convention I've been to. Uh, it's been uh, truly amazing. So, oh, so if anyone is interested to attend those conventions virtually, feel free to send me a message and uh, I'll get you in touch with organizers so maybe they can orient English speakers towards uh, game masters and so on <laughs> yeah, yeah, can, uh, can welcome yeah. you. Uh, but one thing you mentioned, which I thought was very interesting, and uh, I don't know how much you uh, you work in close relationship with Games Workshop. You you hinted at that, but I really like the idea of your games being the first role playing games for a lot of people. Uh, I assume by converting war gamers to tabletop role playing game because. I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit uh, advocate of D and D not being the first game for a, a lot of people. Yeah. I think it, it tends to be a, a too much a narrow ecosystem. So I I like the idea that you got the Warhammer ecosystem, but at least it crosses war games and role playing games. So how, how do you uh, deal with that? How do you approach that? Do you do you show up in war gaming convention and be like, want to try something else? Well, but you are this miniature only now forget about the resident you're just this guy <laughs> yeah i mean we um when we went when we were developing the city system from the start we we wanted it to be welcoming to new players kind of 
you know, people who had never played an RPG before and also people who didn't know anything about Age of Sigmar. You know, we knew that we'd probably get a lot of people coming over from the battle game um, that would be interested in the role-playing game. Maybe even just to read through things. They might never play it, but just to, to have um, information on different things about the world. Um, so, you know, that's why we use D6s, six-sided dice. Anyone who plays the battle game will have a lot of six-sided dice. Anyone who's never played an RPG before will know what a six-sided dice is from playing, you know, family board games or whatever. Um, with the actually bringing people over, a lot of it has, you know, uh, you know, I'm I'm part of a couple of the, the Warhammer Age of Sigmar Facebook groups and and Reddit and all that kind of stuff. But you actually get a lot of other people dropping stuff, links to our stuff in there. Um, you know, that so it's kind of like self-propagating almost. Um, the Age of Sigmar, the the battle game, um, Games Workshop have done a great job at making a um approachable and and you get a lot of a lot of younger players playing i think like I, i've been to warhammer world a couple of times and you often see um moms and dads there with their kids um playing age of sigmar and stuff like that and we seem to have gotten a lot of people um come over from the battle game to the role-playing game and you can see them in the discord you know people will be saying this is my first ever rpg and um, what we've gotten a lot of is a lot of people saying this is my first ever rpg that isn't dungeons and dragons um which is really good because you know we like D D is huge um no matter what and i think after you've like i, when I remember when i first started playing D D, you know you play for a couple of years and then you kind of realize there's other games out there do you know um hopefully D &D is great at, yeah i mean like i i play a lot of D D. you know my group still plays D D. um despite the fact that i we've tried to play other games there's just some people in our group who just like to play D D. um which is fine um but yeah, you, you kind of expand your horizons a bit more. And the game, I think, is very approachable to people. It's not class-based. Um, you know, we have archetypes, which are basically like, <coughs> like a character that's 80% built and gives you a couple of choices to make. Um, and then once you have that, you can grow anywhere. Like there's there's very little, very few requirements and things um, for how your character grows. If you want, you can build your character from the ground up by point by, and you can completely customize it. Um, so yeah, we, tr we tried to make it as welcoming as possible. We knew we'd be getting players from all sides but the goal was to make it um yeah make it as approachable for people coming from the battle game and from people coming from other rpgs or who are brand new to rpgs which uh you know it's <laughs> it's it's not an easy task i think we did okay um but yeah it's 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 not any it's not an easy ask does that compare also to uh lone wolf because uh we did have an ex uh an episode playing lone wolf on the role list uh, which uh, uh, warning for anyone who wants to check it. It's a, an episode I'm very proud of, but we recorded a game as part of my baby shower. So we remain in the theme of parenthood. <laughs> and I swear we didn't drink any alcohol of some kind or any intox intoxicating substance. But yeah, we were very joyous and uh, we were not super respectful of the <clears throat> maybe the spirit of, of Lone Wolf. But uh, I really liked how the game sort of tied with its material source in the sense that it was uh, at least the first adventure in the box set a bit like a uh, what was it called um, fighting fantasy uh, read your own adventure type of, uh, of yeah thing. yeah 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 so did you did yeah, you convert a lot of solo players readers to to role playing games as well uh, with that um, with Lone Wolf yep. Um, well, Lone Wolf was a bit before my time. Um, I joined the company two and a half, closing it on three years ago. I actually can't remember. Time flies. Um, so Lone Wolf, yeah, Lone Wolf was a bit before my time. But um, but yeah, I think that, that would have been part of the goal with Lone Wolf, obviously. I think uh, solo RPGs are picking up in popularity a bit. Definitely, uh, we've had yeah. We've a few people ask if uh, Soulbound could be played one player or two player. Um, it's something we'd like to explore in the future um, with, you know, a, a, their own systems and, and potentially with something like Soulbound, you know, as a solo adventure, a solo player adventure or a two player adventure or something like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, sorry, I'm just losing the train. Oh, there. it's fine. It happens to me all the time on the show. It's well documented. Uh, <laughs> do you know, solo adventure definitely pick, been picking up uh, recently, uh, uh, I guess in part due to, to the pandemic, but it was already happening before that because I remember interviewing yeah, Pelgrane, they were developing a, a whole range of solo adventures. But uh, another thing I, I've heard being 
being picked up by a lot of publishers is uh, digital content and integration for people to play online. Uh, have you looked into that? Did you have the resource to do that at Cubico 7 already with Soulbound and other games? Yeah, so the 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 Warhammer team, the Warhammer Fantasy team are um, working on some stuff in that regard with um, with Roll20 and with the Foundry. Um, they're working on some digital tools for that to use. Um, we're hoping to explore it with Soulbound in the future, um, but we've nothing nothing concrete at the moment. But we try to give people you know the whatever we can you know with our adventures we try to release you know player safe maps and stuff that people can drop into whatever system they're using or just share with the players you know we form fillable character sheets and and party sheets and all that kind of stuff so we try to give people and again you know when you when you pre-order a physical copy from us you get a pdf um that's great so you know you can sh you can share with your with your uh with your friends if they're playing the game as well so um which really helps you know if if you're all sitting around making characters or if you're planning on meeting up at the weekend to game people can make their characters in the in the interim or whatever yeah and you can print um, just a few pages you need to for that bit of the adventure it's 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 way yeah, more convenient exactly. oh yeah and you can just keep your book very pristine in your library and you religiously have a look at it uh, dusting it off carefully yeah. uh, each yeah. time <laughs> Uh, have you been running uh, online games? Uh, I know publishers, well, there's been several conventions, again, who had online versions. So did you show up in, uh, yeah, or did you have to reinvent yourself as part of something like Virtual Expo? Or what, have you been through that experience and what was it like? Yeah, a little bit. So <laughs> we, we were part of um, Gen Con, uh, Gen Con Online. Uh, or was it Gen Con Online? Uh, yeah, it was Gen Con, yeah. So we had some games for that. We uh, we did a lot of Warhammer Fantasy for that. Um, because of the time difference, we had some GMs in the States who who handled that. Um, and then we did Virtually Expo, which I think was excellent. It was really, really well run. Um, we had our own Discord channel for that. People could come in and talk to us. And we ran a couple of games. I ran a couple of games on the, the Friday and Saturday for folks. And we had some other games going on. So we had Soulbound and... and um, uh, Warhammer Fantasy and stuff. Um, I found, like, I when i play with my own home group we we used to um we kind of, what do we use now we basically just use discord um for voice and video and then if we need to use maps or tokens or whatever we just use roll 20. um yeah i found discord to be very very good for for what what you need um but yeah it's it's been an adjustment you know normally you you get a chance to go to the conventions and get in front of people um particularly with soulbound it, it being the first year that it's out um you know, you'd have that opportunity at the big conventions to sit down with people and talk to them and get them excited about the the book and all that kind of stuff, um, and give you know run through some demo games and and that kind of thing to to introduce it to people the first time. Um, well, imagine you know, I'm saying that next. Ideally, the conventions will be back and we'll have a big stack of stuff that people can buy. We'll have the core book and the starter set and other adventures and things like that. Well, I guess it's sort of a uh, good news, bad news situation. I mean. I, I'm developing my own game and uh, there's so many conventions I'm running the game for which I would have absolutely no way of attending in person. Uh, Abacon is yeah. coming, uh, I was supposed to run at Origins, I did something else when it was cancelled. Gen Con I couldn't do it but there's so many conventions happening right now or I'm going to be hopefully to Metatopia. Uh, I, I imagine for, for a publisher it's an opportunity as well to do as many conventions as possible, at least the big ones, to, I, I guess, at a lower cost. And But it's about having people at, at tables play the game and discover what it is like. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. they, they transform into a, a click on the purchase. Yeah, absolutely. You know, cause if we go to conventions, you know, we need to pay for the booth and you have to pay for staff to get there, flights, hotels, all that kind of stuff. Um, and obviously then you have, you know, you've all your your stock and everything there but, and, and you get people coming up to, to do that. The Yeah, the online conventions have been great. Hopefully when things get back to a bit more normality with actual conventions still running, hopefully there's still an online element to it that people can come and, and participate in because um, I, think, I think it's it's really nice to be able to do it. So I think offering both in the future would be great. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's not, nothing quite like you know actually being at the convention and chatting to people. But the online conventions have done a done a great job as well. You know we've done a lot of video content and and seminars and just being in Discord able to chat to people um, has been has been good. So you you've been able to attend uh, quite a few conventions before the pandemic for for Cubicle Seven over those two and a um, half years. I 
I did Essen the first year I was with the company within a, within like two weeks of starting. I think actually I was at <laughs> at Essen, um, and then we didn't go all the following year. Uh, we've done a couple of kind of conventions around Ireland, some in the UK. We did, you know, UK Games Expo, Warhammer Fest, um, Dragon Meat, that kind of thing. I was due to go to Gen Con this year, which would have been my first Gen Con, but of course it was cancelled, uh, which is unfortunate. But, uh, but yeah, normally we have a presence at Origins, Gen Con, um, Essen, Dragon Meat, and all the, the the big ones you'd expect. The UK Games Expo, obviously we're a major sponsor of UK Games Expo. Um so yeah, we'd be we'd be to a lot of the the bigger conventions. Then we have you know trade shows where you go and meet you know distributors and and people who own game stores and things like that. Uh, now I w- I wouldn't be going to those, but you know Cubicle Seven has a presence there. Um, we can introduce people to our new range of games that are coming out and stuff like that. Yeah, I was I had a lot of hope to to go to Dragon Meat where usually uh, Cubicle Seven uh, is, but uh, yeah, we're waiting an announcement on that. But uh, yeah, the weather doesn't look. Uh, uh, clear enough uh, between uh, now and uh, and Christmas, it's but only uh, December, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's last weekend of November or first weekend of December, but uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. <laughs> I was uh, carefully hopeful. Uh, I, I changed the <clears throat> the setting, uh, the status to uh, uh, yeah, resigned, uh, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not confirmed. One way or another, so let, let's hope for for the best. Um, one thing I, I thought is interesting: uh, I had heated arguments online uh, recently, as people do on Twitter. Uh, and in my arguments, I included Cubicle Seven, Modifius, and other businesses your size. Because uh, I'm curious to to hear what you think of that. Um, the debate was whether they were actually publishers which were not it was about the label of indie publisher and oh yeah, yeah. The, the argument my argument was in my mind it might not be the legal term but that an indie publisher was a somewhat a rather small publisher but once you had several lines with core books follow-up supplements and so on in in my view you were not an indie publisher at all which is not something bad or, or good but it's mm. a, it's a distinction and I find it a bit reductive when you say what well, is there's, there's Wizards of the Coast and then everybody else is indie publisher and not make any distinction between Cubicle 7 and uh, let's say I don't know um, what they call the, the people who do Mothership which is an excellent game uh, with the follow up but it's not quite the same thing in terms of scale so uh how do you view yourself uh, if you ever think about that Cubicle 7? And because it, It's a bit of a, an unfair situation because you've heated people defending indie games, heated people defending Dungeons & Dragons uh, somehow, and uh, ro- you're sort of in the middle. And you've been, sometimes it feels like you, you, you are hidden, you're the forest hidden by the tree. So I don't know you, I, I was just Yeah, curious. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we might be the, the, the biggest small publisher that people don't know about, <laughs> basically a lot of the time. Um, the, yeah, the whole, the indie thing, I mean, if you go by independent, which is, you know, what indie is, that you don't really answer to anyone, then, yeah, I think Cubicle 7 falls under that because, you know, Dom owns the company and, and, we decide kind of off our own back what we want to do. Um, I think as soon as you have a license, people, um, you know, have have an attitude about, <laughs> about it. Maybe if if you work with licenses and things, um, but I think license can can give you a vessel to do incredible games, which Definitely, I think is something yeah. that we do. Um, the yeah, it's it, it's a weird one, you know, because I mean we. Yeah, C seven <coughs> has I think maybe twenty full time staff, and we work with. 50 to 100 freelancers on various different uh bases for for our different lines and things like that um if you look at some like wizards of the coast um the dungeon dragon side of it they release maybe four books a year maybe um and we would do that per line so yeah yeah that, that's that's why i know, find it weird sometimes that people view such a difference i mean again by the book, uh, you've got Wizards of the Coast and maybe Fantasy Flight games, which are not indie. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But in terms of uh, 
having a structure in place with the ongoing releases and a level of production in terms of of quality but also you know setting the bar in terms of a a finished product what what it looks like and and also a mm. a volume of of things coming out uh, both in terms of number of products and number of copies being uh, being released yeah i mean i think the the I mean, not to, <laughs> to to get too philosophical about it, but I don't think the labels really help anyone, you know? Yeah. Because I think there's people in, in all sides making great things. And I think for the most part, everyone wants to make something good. You know, if you talk to the people who work for Wizards of Coast, they probably just want to make cool things, you know? Um, yeah, of course, yeah. That's, it's the same with everyone, you know? At the Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to indie. The idea of indie, I suppose, is maybe like it's, Generally, I think it seems to be viewed as a person or a really small team, um, maybe not registered as a, as a company or, or, you know, kind of doing it in, in their spare time and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, whereas if you think about non-indie, i.e. an established company that's been around for a long time, if that's not indie, then I would say, yeah, Cubicle 7 wouldn't be indie because C7 has been around for 10 years. And then had, I think as a full-time company, C7 has been around 10 years and then was around for three to five years before that as an indie company doing stuff in the spare time, you know, releasing games and things like that. Um, so, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a hard one to know. Um, yeah, I think C7 is probably a, a fairly big company, but Diffius is obviously very big, um, you know, like Chaosium and, and a couple of others as well. Yeah. The, co the conversations brought out of uh, my interactions with, yeah, again, some fans of Dungeons and Dragons and uh, I keep bringing that up on the show. It's it's not something against the game itself or the developers of the game. It's just uh, as a result of its disproportionate popularity compared to other games and some players, and probably the fact that those players, a lot of those players are from the US as well. Uh, there's sometimes a somewhat dismissive attitude towards uh, other games, and uh, uh, yeah, in some interaction, D and D fans would would point at games which are not the indie and call them things like, I don't know, uh, the game of the week. Like it was not something with a, a strong follow-up and a strong production mm. line uh, behind it. But, but again, it's probably, I think it's also a US audience uh, thing going on. Uh, how do you interact with US tabletop RPG fans? Uh, does Cubicle 7 have most of their market outside the US or within the US? Uh, or do you do you engage with with that audience, which which has its specific aspects? Yeah, you know, we engage with everyone. I think uh, you know the thing with the the D and D fans, um, or uh, it's any fandom. It's any fandom. Pe people get attached to a fandom or a thing, and then they just turn on whoever's against it. You know, like so the D and D people will be against maybe the indie people. The indie people might be against the D and D people. Like you've seen it as recently as the last few days with. PlayStation and Xbox. Yeah. So, Marvel, like, DC. Yeah. Of that. Yeah. You're, you're always going to have it again. Like, I don't think it helps anyone. I think as long as people are having fun and not hurting anyone and not like attacking anyone online, let people have the fun how they want. If people want to engage with a new side of the gaming um, or aren't aware of it. Yeah. You can say, Hey, look, there's, there's another cool RPG. Do you want to try and play it? And if they don't, they don't. And if they do, you know, they've expanded their horizons a bit more. Um, you know, people might play games after they play D&D &D and never go back to D&D &D, or they might play D&D &D their whole life, you know. Um, but sorry, going back to your question on the how we engage with the, the audience. I mean, yeah, we engage kind of... <laughs> it's hard to know who you're engaging with online, you know. You don't know where they're from half the time. Um, you don't know if they're based in the US or UK or France or, you know, wherever. Um, our Our games are translated into like half a dozen languages i think so we have yeah we have english obviously we have french italian spanish german polish russian japanese i believe um so yeah we we have we have fans all over the world which is amazing you know um but uh but yeah i kind of you know interact with people in the exact same way as we would anyone else trying to help them as much as i can try to lead them to the game that might suit them so dominic is not standing with a big cigar in front of a a graph saying, well, we, we too weak on the Asian market or the US market. We need to push harder <laughs> on Seattle. We, we need those Yankees to, to pick up uh, Soulbound. Nah, no. You know, but like the, the thing is, um, the US is a huge market. 
you know um so i think i can't remember off the top of my head but you know a, a good amount of our sales have come through the us a good amount of them come like direct through our own web store and through the uk and through mainland europe and stuff um depends on the line as well you know doctor who is very popular in the uk but also very popular in the states um warhammer fantasy is very much it's huge in the uk but again you have a lot of people picking it up in the us uh I think people are much more familiar with it um, for various different reasons now through all the video games. So, you know, you have Total War and uh, Warhammer Total War and Vermintide and stuff like that. So people are much more familiar with the world. And then 40K is just always huge. Um, 40K probably has the most penetration in, in the States, I'd say. Um, and then Soulbound, yeah, would be would be pretty popular throughout as well. So, um, but yeah, you know, it's it's... You know, we have people coming to us asking if they can translate the game into whatever language. Um, I saw a few weeks back the the cover for Warhammer Fantasy, the Japanese cover, which is just really cool to see. Uh, you know, and you walk into the book sometimes. I can't find an English version of the Warhammer starter set in our office because I pick one up and it's the German one. I pick one up as the French one. And <laughs> <laughs> I can't actually find an English version of it. Like, uh, yeah, I was on Dom's table the other day. It was like rough knocked which is you know the german version of rough nights and stuff like that um so uh yeah you know that, that we just engage people however they engage with us and, and and try to be polite and helpful with everyone as much as we can so did the japanese version add uh, a new cover or was it the original art with nice kanji yeah title? it's the original art yeah yeah it's the it's the original art with um the obviously the kanji over it um it's, it's just not, very cool to see because it's, it's so, so it's so different to not warmer with big eyes, small mouth, and uh... Uh, no, 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 it's not. It's it, it, it's not. It's still the same same art. Cool. Uh, so uh, the news which are coming now, it's it's soul bound. Uh, are there stuff coming behind which can already be announced or has been uh, announced uh, already? Yeah, yeah. So the um, the core book has finished printing and should be on a boat pretty much now from our printers. Um, so from there, we'll get our delivery to our warehouse in Ireland and um, then some, you know, be shipped to the, our distributors in the States and, and, and everywhere else. So people should start to get the, see them in the their local stores around November. Um, and then as once they arrive here, we'll start shipping them out. So over the course of October, November, people will start getting them delivered into to their direct if they've ordered from us. Um, and then the Soulbound starter set is coming out on Monday. Uh, I'm not sure when this will go, be going out, but Monday, the 28th of September, uh, the Soulbound starter set will go up um, for, for pre-order. Um, if you pre-order it through our website, um, or through a, a, your local game store, it might be parts of Bits and Mortar. You'll get the PDF straight away, so you can start playing straight away if you win, want. Um, and then the actual hard copies will probably land February next year. Um, and then we'll have, we have our first adventure path, or uh, our, our adventure book, Shadows in the Mist, which is set in the city of Amblegard, which is very cool. The first adventure came out for that last month. The next adventure come, should be coming out in the next two, three weeks. And then we'll have four more adventures coming out up to December. Um, and then that'll be finished there. And then what else do we have? <laughs> yes, uh, towards the end of October, early November, we'll have Champions of Order, which is our first kind of player facing, fla facing book. Um, oh. So it has new archetypes. Um, it has the Lumineth Realm Lords, which are the new faction for the, from the battle game. They're um, Teclian elves uh, <laughs> who are very, very cool. Uh, kind of magic user elves. And then we'll have, I think there's uh, maybe 100 talents in the book as well. 50 new spells, 50 new miracles, new endeavors, loads of stuff. So loads of stuff. So more stuff to just expand on your Soulbound game. Sounds uh, like you're... And then we have more plans <laughs> that we have announced on our website, but I won't get into now. <laughs> Ooh. So, so people should keep an eye on your website. They'll find a link in the description of the episode. Uh, so I, I know you're... <clears throat> you will need to go in a bit. Uh, I forgot to use our traditional ice-breaking question, so I'm going to put them right now at the end uh, instead. Uh, uh, what's your routine like at the moment in those times of uh, lockdown, maybe not lockdown, depending where you are and uh, how things are managed? Yeah, it's... Um, I mean, you have young kids. You probably know. You don't get to... <laughs> you wake up when they wake up. Um, well, so, I take yeah, advantage my, my partner... of my son's nap to record these things. So as soon as it's over, I wake up my son from his nap. 
Yeah, yeah. Once you have two kids, you don't get that anymore because <laughs> one of them is always awake. Um, but yeah, no, I, like my 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 partner is a teacher, so she teaches uh, kids the five and six year olds. Um, so you know, we're up about half six in the morning, get the kids fed and dressed, and get them in front of hay doggy, and then they go off to to play school or 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 to their uh, grannies to be minded, and then yeah, I start work usually about eight o'clock probably um and yeah i'm working from home most days um i go into the office maybe two days a week uh which just involves driving up uh, it's about an hour drive up oh, traffic is great now <laughs> um, it's very easy to get to the office um yeah so maybe two days a week i'm in the office but the rest of the day i'm uh, i'm at home um working away so work eight o'clock and take a couple of breaks to have tea and try and do a couple of jobs around the house and then finish up around four or five, depending, uh, depending on what's going on. But, uh, but yeah, it's yeah, I'm getting well used to it. I get more done at home than I do in the office. So <laughs> yeah, it seems to be the case. I'm, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I'm unlucky, lucky to be unemployed since before the lockdown. So the bad news is I don't have a salary. I don't have a job. The good news is that I'm available to care of my son while my wife is working from home. But, it doesn't seem to impair uh, productivity uh, as far as I can tell from uh, her experience and uh, the experience uh, of, of people I know. Uh, the other question yeah, well, is... It's a full-time job. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, pff, yeah, we, we don't have... Uh, that, that's something we, we keep discussing about. We, we don't have the, the luck of having uh, grandparents at hand. Mm, and even if... Yeah, yeah. Because they're abroad, but and even if they were around here, uh, they because uh yeah we both me and my wife uh, our parents are somewhat old we we didn't have kids very young ourselves and our parents didn't either so uh we they couldn't take care of my son so that that would be a, an issue uh but yeah enough about me. uh the 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 second ice breaking question was supposed to be did you pick up any new hobby interest or skills uh as a result of the the lockdown um i don't think so oh, <laughs> my, my my hobby is kind of my job now so uh, i actually i probably actually game less which is a pity um myself and my partner my, my wife have uh, a couple of games that we play We're playing arkham horror a bit um we played through hogwarts battle and, and, and stuff like that the the board games card games um I like to cook a lot, so on days I work from home, I, I, I cook. I got a couple of new cookbooks and things like that. So oh, anything uh, yeah, nice that's, that's uh, kind of to recommend? Uh, yeah, I got um, I, I I think they have it in the UK. Wagamamas, do you know they're kind of Japanese. Yeah, yeah, uh, restaurant. yeah. I got their cookbook. It's actually it's it's fine. Um, it's the good thing about it is there's no kind of crazy ingredients. I would say you know there, you'll have most things in your house. Yeah. You know? Um, and nothing nothing too difficult um so they have like their katsu curries and and ramen dishes and stuff like that which is which is really nice but uh yeah i have a couple of gordon ramsay books there and he's see gordon ramsay is more kind of my kind of my kind of speed i think um yeah we yeah, got... i want to i want to pick up a, a mexican mexican recipe book I, I love mexican food so i need to start making it for myself yeah, I haven't been trying Mexican that much. For Japanese, we've got uh, Everyday Arumi, which is really nice. The excellent mm. recipes. But it's sort of... I will pick it up f sometimes for a month. Because, uh, as you said, that's when you've got your you got your mirin, you've got soy sauce, yeah. I always have. But there's, there's a number of different ingredients which are, yeah, exactly, are yeah. common to most of the recipes. So if you do it on a regular basis, it's fine. Or if you do... 10 in a row it's fine but if you want to do an individual one uh, it's a bit annoying to find or oh, you can find bonito da dashi stock uh, to, cook, yeah, to cook it yeah, somewhere yeah yeah tamarind paste I cannot find tamarind paste but uh, oh, one of the substitutes for tamarind paste is lime and I love lime so that'll do <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this week we, we're going to do a Otolenghi recipe we haven't done for a bit, uh, which is not too complicated and people can find it online. It's uh, tagliatelle with walnuts and sage. It's really good. Oh, I nice. really recommend it. I mean, France France is the home of cooking, right? I mean, you, you should be a great cook. I'm not French. That's where, um, all, that's where all the best... Belgian oh, food sorry, is. Oh, sorry, you're not French. Belgian. God, sorry, my apologies. Uh, I, I have France I, in my head. I identify, I identify as a Londoner, but French is my <laughs> first language because that's uh, what 
roughly 50 percent oh, belgium you should be able to make good beer then right not to <laughs> yeah yeah but like you i know, can make good whiskey <laughs> Be belgian beer companies you know why you find belgium beers everywhere in the world well for years we lamented with friends we were an inter we were much younger and we were not at an age or certainly didn't have the mean to be entrepreneurs but we would lament uh, to some extent that everywhere in the world you would find Irish pubs but although Belgium mm. had very good products you wouldn't have something similar around the world and we lamented over yeah. the the lack of entrepreneurship of uh, Belgian citizens often and companies and uh, now you find everything all across the world the reason being it's been all bought up by a Brazilian brewing company so your your oh, your shime oh. your your lef all of that the reason you find them in pubs around the world is because uh, Brazilians are much better entrepreneurs than than Belgian ones so it's kind yeah. of a, a sour note but yeah uh, one of the many reasons I left Belgium <laughs> because I was like yeah you know what? yeah so it's so, on and yeah food it's i was in i was in brussels actually a few years ago it was actually actually would have been when my wife was pregnant with um with our first son so god what's that five and a half years ago at the uh christmas markets um but yeah the beer i, I love the, love the <laughs> beer oh, god. This, they're very good products and products which are lesser known but uh i know yeah that friend actually now is the owner of a belgian beer bar in barcelona so <laughs> if, if viewers, uh, La Maison Belge uh, in uh, Rambla do Brasil. I'm not sure it's open at the moment for reasons. For obvious reasons, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I recommend to to check it out. And in terms of food, there's somewhat of a tradition, but it's the country's been very Americanized, uh, even mm, more than like England. Like a lot of places, really. So it's uh, they didn't maintain and cultivate it as the french did uh so it's sort of it's there sort is of there are basically irish cuisine basically does not exist there is no like irish cuisine it's it's basically british cuisine but worse like it's just like potatoes and cabbage and ham and that's it like it's <laughs> well, there, there are a few things in belgium cuisine which are interesting like pastries i, I guess what's what's interesting with them is that you've got this it's not straight out of that, but there's this sort of common Roman ground, not Roman as from Rome, Italy, but uh, only Roman Empire thing. So Belgium was a crossroad 15th century between Spain, France, Germany. So you got this influence of sweet and sour with a lot of foreign spices because they would be traded in Belgian cities or at a time when Belgium was not a thing, an entity in itself. You had Flanders uh, and Wallonia mm. to a lesser extent. Uh, been part of Burgundy. So f stuff with cinnamon. A bit like... Okay, also sort of stuff you find a bit... It's kind of an in-between place. Between uh, sure, yeah. Nordic stuff, it, with even Spanish influence for, for historical reason because Belgium's been... The territory's been Spanish much longer than they've been French. Uh, so... It's a, it's not place with an interesting story. Nobody bothers to learn, uh, especially not the Belgian. So, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you so much for joining, Emmet. Do you have anything else you wish yeah, to absolutely. plug? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, the 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 core book will be landing in shops in the next few months. Um, and yeah, the starter set will be out Monday, the twenty eighth of September. So if you pre order that um from our store, you'll get a PDF copy straight away. So the um, and then a lot of the Sorry, hello the hello Duggy core book with the game master screen with the pull out characters yeah i wish yeah i'm gonna get on go that. for I'll it give, i'll give the B, i'll give the bbc a ring <laughs> yeah go <laughs> ahead you you already know them thanks to dr wu so. yeah exactly yeah yeah maybe the doctor who guys can introduce yeah this. <laughs> it's probably the next office or something like that yeah you, yeah you, you exactly go for yeah, it yeah yeah cool um yeah no that, that that's it um i suppose folks if they have a local game shop just make sure that they're part of the bits and mortar um program if you just i think it's bits and mortar.com it basically just the the game store can sign up and if you pre-order a book from them they can give you the pdf so they basically can do the same thing that we do if you order through our website so it's just it's a it's a great thing for people to have we've got a popular uh 
brick and mortar shop uh, not too far from I am. It's called Bad Moon Cafe. I recommend to check it out. It's very popular with fans of Warhammer. And uh, yeah, when things will be better, actually the plans. Uh, I think I, I came to discuss it with somewhat uh, at your team, but uh, yeah, we had D and D for mental health, and I know the the manager of Bad Moon Cafe would be was interested in us trying to. Get in touch with you and uh, Games Workshop to do a. Yeah, that sounds from the name sounds familiar actually. Yeah, we we I think I reached uh, I came to chat with someone at your booth regarding the the possibility of doing a Warhammer for mental health, but uh, yeah. that we have to wait a year or two for things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how things go. But we will have a lot to talk about when this happens. Yeah, absolutely. in terms of mental Gosh, health yeah. and t- self care. Yeah. Great, Emmet. Where can people find you if you wish to be found? Uh, I'm on Twitter, and we have our own Discord. So my Twitter is Emmetation, which is E M M E T A T I O N, um, and then we have our uh, fan Discord. I'm fairly active in there as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. I try to not do uh, too much social media, but it's uh, it's hard. <laughs> Well, I put links to all of that in the description of the episode, so people, please do check it out. Uh, we are at September 23rd, so I believe today is going to be released a panel. Uh, recorded, I recorded with Albacan, so you can go check it out. And also, as part of Albacan, I will be running my game, several sessions of Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventorying, which is about uh, all self-care and making sure that in your inventory, you only keep, you only keep things which spark joy. So I recommend people come join me to to play this. Emmet, thank you again. Lovely. And uh yeah, Thanks people, so much. take care, see ya.